Hello and a very warm welcome to our service. Today we'll be thinking about eternal life. Maybe this isn't something you think about often, but it's certainly something to consider, whatever your beliefs. For those who believe in Jesus, eternal life with him is the future we're looking forward to when we'll be with God in perfect relationship with him. But that leaves us with a question. How do we know about eternal life? Or what is the truth about it? And where can we find these answers? Well, this is what one of Jesus's friends said to him. Simon Peter answered Jesus, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. And in our service today, we're going to be seeing that wonderful truth that Jesus holds the words of eternal life. He is the way to God, our Heavenly Father. Well, we're gonna sing now of the greatest story, the wonderful story of the whole of creation. Let's praise our God as we thank him for bringing us into this story, into his great story of love and redemption. Let's sing.
as Christians, we trust in the death and resurrection of Jesus. He promises to take all those who repent and believe in him to be with him for eternal life. So as we do each week, we're gonna to come to a time of prayer where we say sorry to God. And repentance is part of the daily Christian life and we're acknowledging together now our need for the Lord's forgiveness. And we pray to a forgiving and merciful Lord. So please join me in the response if you'd like to. Heavenly Father, we confess that we so often go our own way rather than following your perfect way for us. Forgive us, we pray. Gracious Lord, forgive us when we've relied on our own strength and the things of this world to provide our security rather than finding that security in you. Forgive us, we pray. Wonderful Lord Jesus, you are the way, the truth and the life. Forgive us when we do not live out this truth in our daily lives. Forgive us, we pray. Faithful Lord Jesus, forgive us for when we shy away from acknowledging you as our Lord and King, who rescues us for eternal life in your kingdom. Forgive us, we pray. Amen. As repentant sinners, we trust in Jesus' sacrifice that rescues us for eternal life. And we have the assurance from God that he forgives us. Listen to what Psalm 103 says. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Our sins are gone. Well, I'm going to continue to pray a few short prayers for our world now. So let's pray. Sovereign Lord, we pray for the many afflicted people whose lives have been devastated as a result of the invasion in Ukraine. Lord, we mourn over the loss of life and extreme suffering. Please be with those who are desperately seeking to leave dangerous places to reach safety. We also pray for all those who've been displaced. Lord, may they find hope in you and know despite these terrifying times, you can be trusted. Please bring rescue. In Jesus' name, amen. And Heavenly Father, we also pray for all those who are fleeing their homes all around the world as they are afraid, vulnerable and traumatized. May we and your worldwide church be loving and compassionate as we welcome all people into our churches, lives and into our homes. Always seeking, Lord, to love those who are vulnerable, just like our Lord Jesus did. Lord, may you bring true hope to all facing this darkness. For your glory we pray. Amen. We also pray for those whose work is specifically caring for diaspora communities here in London. So we pray for Dada, one of our mission partners, and his family as they care for and reach out to those in and around King's Cross. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God of all comfort, we are heartbroken as we hear about children all around the world struggling to survive the desolation resulting from awful situations like famines and wars. We remember in particular those who are in severe crises and facing starvation. Those in Afghanistan, Somalia, Yemen and many others. You showed your love for children as you walked this earth. Please Lord, rescue them from these painful situations they're in. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Lord, we thank you for the eternal hope we have in the Lord Jesus. Please bring many nations to the same assurance of eternal peace and joy with you. We pray all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, let's finish our prayers together by saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Well, we're going to sing again, and this is a wonderful song called Come As You Are. I've got a few bits of information to share with you. Last week, we hosted Rachel Den Hollander for our latest Pillar and Step interview. She has a remarkable story that I would highly recommend to you to listen to. It's available to watch free online at pillarandstep.com. And next week, look out for details of another Pillar and Step interview, which will be available online as we hear from Major General Tim Cross discussing war and peace and how he has grappled with conflict and a faith in Jesus. And maybe you're interested in finding out more about the Christian faith and where Rachel and Tim find their hope. Well, we've got an opportunity for you to do just that. Hope Explored is starting in a week on Monday, Monday the 28th, and at 7.30 you can join online or in person and you can find out more details using the link. And then just a final thing to mention, while Rachel Den Hollander was here with us, she spoke last Saturday at a conference we hosted, the Gospel and Abuse Conference. The talks from this conference are now available online using the link. Um, tickets are £10 and all the funds raised are going to the work we do through Tamar, which is a ministry reaching out to trafficked women in our local area. Well, let's join together to thank our Lord for sustaining the work here and the ministries that support wider afield. So we say together as we do each week, all things come from you, O Lord, and of your own do we give you. Amen. 
Well, I'm going to hand over to Rico now. Well, it's a great joy to have Jordan here. Um, we tend in these guest events to ask people what it means for them to be a follower of Christ. Yeah. Jordan, it's just great to have you at All Souls. You're doing a placement with us. So thanks for giving a talk last week. I know you're married to Min. And Pippi, you're uh, just, how old is she? How old is Pippi, uh, your she daughter? She's 16 months tomorrow. 16 months tomorrow, so great, you've had a baby girl. But it would be lovely to hear your story, Jordan. Yeah. So just tell us, um, did you come from a Christian home? Were you always a Christian? Tell us about what were you like before you were a Christian. So I did come from a Christian home, but it was a very broken Christian home. Mm. Um, my parents were divorced uh, when I was 10. And um, my dad got into drugs and ended up in prison. And uh, it was quite tough. And so although there was a knowledge of Christian faith there, mm. but actually your experience of life was pretty tough. What, I mean, what were you feeling as you, your parents split, your dad had that calamity? I yeah. mean, what, what, were the, what was the internal journey there? So I was very angry, um, very lost, confused. Um, I didn't feel loved at all. Um, and so I, I think I had a, a bit of a resentment towards, towards God. And actually, Jordan, where were you living physically or geographically? Because that may not make yeah. as much sense to people when we learn. Where, where were you? Where were you? Where did you grow up? Uh, yeah, I grew up in a very gloomy place uh, called Hawaii. So you were and, there. Uh, yeah. But nevertheless, this experience. Yeah. And so what happened then, Jordan? So that's where you were. Um, tough, mm -hmm. tough childhood. Yeah. What then happened? So it, it all started when uh, my cousin invited me to a Christian camp. And for the first time, I, I felt... I felt love, um, and it felt very inviting. And, and for the first time, God uh, was real to me, and and I discovered who Jesus was. And I I didn't understand what the Bible was about, but I just knew that I was loved, and that that made a big difference in my life. And then, so you were a professing faith, but I know meeting mm -hmm. Min, your wife, now was mm -hmm. was a was a big thing. What difference did she make to your journey? So you're a young Christian, you meet Min. What mm -hmm. what did she explain that was so helpful? So. I remember she, she was actually in London and I was in Hawaii and we were kind of doing long distance at the time. And we were discussing uh, Romans 6, Romans 7, because at that time I knew who Jesus was. I knew what was the right thing to do, but I just couldn't help myself. I, I was running away from God and I was, I was sinning and I couldn't stop myself. And she helped me to realize that, you know, God loves me anyway. He loves me unconditionally and I can't stop myself, but he wants to help me through that. Um, and so that made the wor a world of difference to me. That blew my mind. So one, knowing that you were forgiven, but secondly, yeah. knowing that he'd give you the resources to battle against yeah, exactly. your sin. Yeah. And so, Jordan, what difference does it now make mm. for you being a, a, a Christian man? Um, so what's the, what's the difference? I guess the difference is, I mean, I have a couple examples. Uh, one example is I struggled with anger. Um, and I, th I thought it was a power and I thought it was a strength. And now I realize that uh, it's a weakness. And because of Jesus, I know who I am. I know that I'm loved. I know that um, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. And I don't have to have this chip on my shoulder. And so I can you know, love my, my family. Um, and through that, that's, that's a huge blessing. Because I didn't want to replicate what happened to me. Um, and I was, I was scared of that. So you really find your Christian faith has sort of given you a way of intercepting that anger yeah, and being it, a much safer husband and it's, father. It's breaking the, the generational curses that, that I see through in my family. And, I, and I, was, I was really terrified of replicating that. Uh, but now I can see that it's, it's stopped. And Jordan, look, I've heard you sing. I've heard you give a talk at Christian Explored. Mm -hmm. I mean, just tell us what you're doing now and again, how that shapes going forward. Yeah, so, um, so I'm a musician. I come from a family of musicians. Um, and in that, there was a lot of drugs and alcohol. And, and that's another thing I didn't want to replicate. And I always told myself that I didn't want to do anything to do with music um, because that would, uh, that would happen. Um, but I realize now that that's God's gift that he's given me. And it's not that I'm singing for myself now. I'm, I'm singing for God. Mm. And that's, that's the huge shift that's mm. made me realize that, you know, I can, I can use my gift and I can enjoy it um, uh, while giving joy to others. 
Jordan, it's wonderful to talk to you. It's great to have Min and Pippi in the church family. And thank you for sharing your story. Thank you. We're going to sing again now. This song is a prayer, a prayer we'd live for God's glory. It begins, what good is it to gain the whole world, yet lose your soul? Let's pray as we sing that we'd seek God's kingdom first. Do join in as we sing together. What good is it to gain the whole world but lose your soul? What good is it to make a sweet sound but remain proud? In you of God's mercy finds me My name is Penny Clayton, and this morning's reading is from the book of Luke, chapter 16, verses 19 to 31. That's the book of Luke, chapter 16, verses 19 to 31. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died, and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was in torment, He looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, 
Remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been set in place, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. My dad spent 38 years in a tobacco multinational, so his career was making cigarettes, and he spent those years in the same company. And in that time, I, I think we had, perhaps as a family, two or three conversations about the dangers of smoking and health. So basically, as a family, we lived in denial about what smoking did to people. A family friend who had sons of 14 and 16 died of cancer. He was a heavy smoker. He died of lung cancer, but we just didn't talk about it. He just died of cancer. Now, to be honest, I never challenged my father about the work he did. He was a wonderful dad to me. I didn't challenge him, but really you could at one level say that, you know, in his career, he killed people. And I now as a vicar bury them at one level. I have to say in recent years though, I felt a little less guilty about my dad's career. I'd never try and justify it, please hear me. But, but I wouldn't justify the tobacco industry, but I felt less guilty about it because of what appears on cigarette packets today. Smoking kills. Smoking causes nine out of 10 lung cancers. Smoking when pregnant harms your baby. Now, I think that gives people a pretty clear warning as they buy a packet of cigarettes about whether to smoke or not. The only question is, do you think this is a trustworthy warning? Is it reality or not? The title of our sermon this morning, what is reality? Now, in this passage we've got in front of us, Jesus is being as blunt and as direct as this cigarette packet. He's being absolutely straight. And the only answer is, the only question is, do you think this is reality? Matthew Henry, a Christian commentator, writing 300 years ago, said this, millions are ruined by believing that God will not be so strict as his word says he will. By this lie, Satan has ruined humanity. Of course, Matthew Henry is referring there to the Garden of Eden, where uh, the devil, in the form of the snake, lied to Adam and Eve and said, well, God doesn't, you won't die, and God doesn't want you to be like him, and they didn't believe it and the judgment of death came. So millions don't believe, but this red hot parable, what do you think? It's red hot, but do you believe it? A parable is a literary device for teaching spiritual truths. So this is a story with a spiritual cutting edge. And I'm not going in for any medieval literalism here. This isn't meant to be history, but this parable nevertheless points to some chilling realities. And I have three points, two men, two destinies, and five living brothers. So first of all, two men. The first man, well, I wonder if you can see him in verse 19, he is phenomenally wealthy. Verse 19, there was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. So this man has the most fashionable clothes that money can buy. Not a day passes without some splendid banquet. The word gate here in verse 20 is not a small side gate, 
It's a massive, huge ornamental portico. It's like the gates of Buckingham Palace. So this guy lives in a vast mansion. His suits are from Savile Row. His shirts are from German Street. His ties are from Harrods. And what would his day be? I don't know. In London, breakfast at the Savoy, lunch at Simpsons, tea at Claridge's, dinner at the Dorchester. That's his life. And material prosperity oozes from his clothes, his house, his food. We're told that he has a great life. And do you see verse 25? It's fascinating what Jesus warns here. Verse 25, but Abraham replied, son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things. This man has received so many gifts from God that he doesn't have a problem until the day he dies. God has lavished so many gifts upon, upon him that honestly, life is in just one upward trajectory. It's very interesting. Some people think that uh, a friend may start thinking about the Christian faith once something goes wrong for them. Well, this man, he's been given so many gifts that nothing goes wrong for him. He doesn't have a problem until he dies. That's when his problems begin. In the card game of life, he's been dealt two aces and two kings. It's quite hard to play that hand badly. Luxury lavished upon him, all the opportunities, every door open, every network, there it was. So he's a faceless millionaire who, who doesn't care for the beggar at his gate. He knows Lazarus's name because in hell he says, send Lazarus. But he drives past this man every day in his Rolls Royce, sees him sprawled on the pavement, but shuts his heart to him. Doubtless he would have watched hundreds of thousands of refugees come out of Ukraine, and it wouldn't occur to him to open up his country house that stands empty for 48 weeks of the year. He's hardened his heart to the vulnerable, to the poor, to the refugee. They mean nothing to him. Uh, they're not his business. They need to pull their socks off. That's nothing to do with his life. He has no time for the outsider. Now, the second man could not be more different. Jesus paints a picture of abject poverty as extreme as the rich man's opulence. At his gate was laid. The word in the original is sprawled. Uh, a, a beggar sprawled named Lazarus, facing the sneering contempt of passers-by. Get a job or whatever they're saying to him. No fine clothes. In fact, the only thing that covers his back are sores, probably from malnutrition. And the dogs come and lick his sores. I once saw a man in Delhi with a vast red sore on his leg. He was on crutches. And I'd imagine the dogs would have liked to have licked that. So it's chronic malnutrition which defines his life. And you see verse 21, longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. So at dinner time, he rips open the bin liners. That's how he eats from the rich man's table. He pulls them open and gets some scraps. So that's what he is, and that's where he lies as the dog lick his sores. But there's one thing that this poor man has got, which the rich man hasn't got. I wonder if you can see it. It's so obvious we can easily miss it. Verse 20, at his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus. This is the only time in one of Jesus' parables that he gives a character a name. And a name means you have significance. It means you're known. Lazarus in Hebrew is Eleazar, and it means he whom God helps. So Lazarus, by his name, knows God, and God knows him. And amazingly, he doesn't blame God for his suffering. He's not wreathed in bitterness. No, he looks patiently to the Lord. We learn from his name that he looks to God. He's breathing out arrow prayers all the time. His pain doesn't result in resentment. It doesn't sever his relationship with God. No, he says, Lord, I trust in you. You're my hope. And it's very interesting, isn't it? The rich man hardens his heart to people in the midst of his luxury, and the poor man does not harden his heart to God in the midst of his poverty. Now, I don't know what you think of that, but it's an amazing thing. I wonder, as we think of COVID and Ukraine, often it's a question we must ask ourselves if we're Christian people. Can God trust me with suffering? I mean, I've not really suffered in my life, but uh, I wonder if God could trust me with it. 
is my faith in God or my agenda for God, which partly is to make sure I avoid suffering? I don't know. But Lazarus, I can tell you, is an example to me. So here are these two men, one with no identity, the other known to God. Oh, one vastly wealthy, the other on the pavement, but trusting in his Lord. And the question is, who of these two men would you rather be? Which one? One languishing on the street, the other in luxury, opening up, uh, you know, throwing out his bin liners to the other. Well, as we decide which man you'd rather be, we move to our second point, two destinies. So they're two men, but we now see they have two, destiny, uh, two destinies. And Jesus now pulls back the curtain on eternity. We see into eternity. We look. And let's have a look and see where we are in verse 22. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. So here we learn that life is short. Verse 22, the time came when... The beggar died, when the rich man died, Abraham is already dead. In fact, everyone in the verse is dead. I, I tell you what, that's how you get struck off the Christmas card list at a dinner party. Say to your hostess, have you thought about your death recently? But that's what we're being told here in this red-hot parable. Uh, everyone's died. And surely COVID and Ukraine have taught us about the fragility of life. Billy Graham, the evangelist, was asked, what has most surprised you about life? And he replied, it's brevity. I buried, I took the funeral of my best friend from school in November. Uh, I can't believe he's gone. He was such a life force, force but life is short. We're mid-50s and he's gone. Uh, Psalm 90 verse 12 says, teach us to number our days aright that we may gain a heart of wisdom. The Bible says that life is like a mist that comes down in the morning and evaporates. It's like chaff that you throw in the air and it blows away. Our life is like water that you spill into the ground and it's gone. It's like a dream when you awake, you wake up, what was that about? Uh, you, you know, all those things are said about life in the psalm. It's like a sigh. <sighs> We're like grass. As for man, his days are like grass, I said at my friend's funeral. We flourish like a flower of the field. The wind blows and its place remembers it no more. We fade away. I mean, like many of you, I'm sure, I was just so shocked to hear of the death of Shane Warne, the, the greatest leg spinner in cricket history. And this is what the obituary said. It said, it seems inconceivable, someone so full of energy, so fizzing with enjoyment of life's rich possibilities, should be dead at the age of 52. But the key point here is not so much that we'll die, which we will, uh, and we don't know when it'll be, but that death is not the end. The coffin is not an exitless box. So these two are in a conscious state after death. They're preserved in this conscious state. Here are two men, and they encounter two very different destinies, to which the question is, Rico, how do you know that? How do you know? And the reason is because of the resurrection of Jesus. So Jesus lived and taught. He had a band of followers. He was tried in a Roman and Jewish court. He was sentenced to die. They strung him up on a cross. They put a spear through his side. They took him off the cross. They certified him as dead. And three days later, he was walking around again. And if he got through death himself, he could get me through. If he got through death himself, it's the promise that we'll be raised. And interestingly, the resurrection is referred to by Jesus in the Bible, time and again, it's given as evidence of the afterlife and of the judgment to come. But this man, this rich man, is so hard-hearted that he won't look at the evidence. And the reason for that is that he doesn't want to open his heart to his maker or to the poor. It's too inconvenient. It'll get in the way of the self-centered life that he wants to lead. Have you heard the phrase, True faith is not believing something in spite of the evidence. It's believing something in spite of the consequences. True faith forces me to open my life up to the poor whom God has made. I'm responsible to my fellow human beings who are made in God's image, who are so precious that Christ died for them. I can't, if I have true faith, watch what's happening in Ukraine or has happened in Afghanistan, these crises, and go, oh, nothing to do with me. 
No, true faith puts me in a global village. These people are fellow human beings. And it's not this rich man can't believe in God, it's that he won't. It's far too inconvenient. He doesn't want that in his life. But the resurrection gives hope in the face of death and a warning that this is all true, that there's a life to come. The first funeral I ever took was of a young guy called Stuart Spencer. He was 38, 39, a PhD, a very intelligent man. And I saw him three days before he died of leukemia. I had this awful moment of sort of, I don't know, immature voyeurism. So I suddenly said, I can't believe I said this, as I was visiting him as a clergyman, I said, Stuart, what's it like to die? And he looked at me immediately and he said, Rico Christ has risen. What's it like to die? Rico Christ has risen. As he thought about death, all his trust was in the risen Christ who could pull him through death. That's how he made sense of his life. That was the story he was in. Jesus would get him through. And what does it feel like, verse 22, to be at Abraham's side? Lazarus, who's trusted in God, he's taken to Abraham's side. Joy indeed for the Jew to be at the patriarch's side. Well, it's to enjoy the new creation, to enjoy an existence guaranteed by the resurrection of Jesus. And Stuart had a favorite verse, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. So think, if you would, of the best moment you've ever had in your life. What's been the best moment? What's been your most glorious moment of joy and adulation or happiness? Well, take that moment and multiply its, its, its um, extent by infinity, and that's what it feels like to be in the new creation. I, I don't know what your moment is. One couple said we were both holding our baby when he first smiled. But whatever it is, multiply its intensity by infinity, its duration by eternity, that's what heaven will feel like, and it's guaranteed by the resurrection of Jesus. And it's not a game, it's not a feeling in my tummy. It's something that Jesus, because he was raised, if I trust in him, will deliver to me if I've also trusted in his forgiveness on the cross. And that's where Lazarus is as he trusts in God. But what, as we move on, do we read here in this red-hot parable of the rich man's destiny? This man who's hardened his heart to the poor at his gate. Can we see verse 23? Can we see what we're told about the rich man? In Hades, where he was in torment. So can I say the Lord Jesus Christ, the most loving man that ever lived, who said in the Sermon on the Mount, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. And then as he died, as he was being murdered, cried out, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. This man, who exemplifies the model life, he taught love your enemies, he did it as he was being murdered, he warns us of a place called hell. And you see, it's interesting. When I take my friend's funeral, people want me to talk of eternal life. How can I trust Jesus for that, for heaven, if I can't also see what he says about a place called hell? And can I tell you, Jesus in the Bible, ladies and gentlemen, is the theologian of hell. If we don't hear what Jesus has said on hell, we don't know who Jesus is. Have a look through Matthew's gospel and see how he speaks of hell again and again and again. Matthew 5, 22, Matthew 5, 29, Matthew 7, verses uh, 10 to 12. Uh, on it goes again and again, uh, Matthew 8, verse 12. It comes again and again, this talk of hell. Um, if we want heaven and the new creation, surely we must be warned of hell as well. So what Jesus says in Hades, in hell, where is this? He was in hell in verse 23, where he was in torment. So to say there's no hell is to call Jesus a liar. If you hear a clergyman say there's no hell, he's saying Jesus is a liar. You can't trust him. And at the heart of the Christian faith is being saved from hell through the cross for heaven. So Jesus bore our sin. He paid our debt. He endured our penalty. He died our death. He pays in death and blood so that we can be forgiven. Um, I grew up in Africa, and in Africa I had two hobbies, stamp collecting and butterflies, and both are amazing in Africa, and for both of them you needed one of these, a magnifying glass. 
But I soon found as a little boy in Africa that making little boys, uh, making li little uh, things bigger w w was not the only thing a magnifying glass could do. I found that if you took one of these into the midday sun, the possibilities were endless. You could set alight a leaf or a piece of newspaper or even the gardener's hut. And best of all, I found if you held your twin sister down, you could scare the living daylights out of her with one of these. Imagine if you would a massive moral magnifying glass the size of this room, and through it our past, not the sun's rays, but God's righteous judgment at the gossip, the hatred, the godlessness, the self-centeredness, the lust in my heart. And imagine it all comes down, down, down until it hits one man at one point in history. That's how Jesus saves me from the coming wrath. And the only way to get to hell is to trample over the cross of Jesus. He blocks the way. He says, I've paid for your forgiveness. I've paid. But if we want to go to hell, we have to ignore the cross of Jesus. So Jesus says there's a place called hell. Secondly, he says in verse 23, it's a place of torment, where he was in torment. I mean, what would this look like on camera? It speaks of a conscious agony after death. And the question is, why? What has this man done that merits this? And I wonder if you can have a look at the four words on the cigarette packet. This is the warning from verse 25. What's the warning on the cigarette packet? It's this, it's remember what you received. That's the warning to this rich man. Remember that your reference points, your goals, your aims for self-fulfillment, they were utterly self-centered. You ignore the poor man at your gate. You forgot him. This is about the sin of omission. This man's sin was not being rich. It's not a sin to be rich and make money. No, it's what he did with his money. The Bible is perfectly clear that if you have money, it's a gift from God and you ought to be generous with it. Stewardship is required. Deuteronomy chapter 8 says that, uh, and it's preached at the point at which Moses is leading the people of God into the promised land. They're about to go into a great land. And, and they're promised it's a land, Deuteronomy 8, 8, of brooks and streams, deep springs gushing out of the valleys and hills, a land with wheat and barley, vines, fig trees, pomegranates, olive oil, honey, a land where bread will not be scarce and you'll lack nothing, a land where the rocks are iron and you can dig copper out of the hills. And after all that they've received, the people of God are warned. You may say, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me, but remember the Lord your God, it's he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. Uh, this man set about his aims and goals for self-fulfillment. He just forgot about God and the beggar at his gate. It was the sin of omission. And it wasn't just that this man lived a selfish life. It was also that his heart of sin actually ignored the message of Jesus. Verse 27, he answered, then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they won't also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they'll repent. In other words, the rich man says, look, if they have an amazing Scrooge-like ghost experience, as in A Christmas Carol, if they have this incredible supernatural experience, they'll believe this this warning. But back down to the passage, he said, Abraham says, if they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, if they don't listen to the warnings of scripture, well, they won't be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. So Abraham says, your brothers were given Bibles. So were you. They were given a Bible at confirmation. Their granny gave them a Bible. They had a Bible in the house, but they ignored the beggar at their gate and they ignored the Bible. And actually, Jesus says, remember how you just shut your heart to the poor and you shut your heart to the Bible. It was too inconvenient. Now, what is the Bible about? Actually, interestingly, what's the message of Moses and the prophets? Well, Jesus, after he's risen from the dead and appears to two of the disciples on the Emmaus Road in Luke chapter 24, Verse 27 says, we read that in the Bible study, he, it says, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. So the Bible 
is about Jesus' rescue on the cross. And this man, as he rejected the Bible, was rejecting the forgiveness he so badly needed. Because that's what the message of Moses and the prophets leads up to. It tells me that we've sinned and we need a rescuer. Now, it's very interesting. If we go next door to the BBC, and by the way, they're wonderful neighbours to us, but if we go next door, actually, they think that whether I accept the Bible or not and the rescue of Jesus is an intellectual decision. But the Bible says no. To reject the death of Jesus as God has sent his son to die for, for my sin is the heart of sin. The Holy Spirit comes to convict of sin because we don't believe in Jesus. To not believe in this rescue is not an intellectual decision, it's a sin. I've got a son called Daniel, he's nine. He's a physical little chap, he's got a big heart. Say you were outside All Souls one day and a lorry was about to hit you, you were totally oblivious to it. Daniel ran across, pushed you out the way and got hit and killed by the lorry himself. And say you turned around and you saw his dead body and I knew that he died to rescue you and you'd say, he didn't need to do that, I was fine. Can I say, can you imagine how as a father I'd feel? God sends his son to die and people go, we don't need it. Can I tell you, to suppress that truth is the heart of what makes God angry. I mean, there's nothing God could do more than send his son to die for our sin and yet we suppress that truth. And so here is this man and he's forgotten the poor and he's hardened his heart to the rescue of Jesus and Abraham says, remember what you received. That's the warning on the packet. And actually, over the gates of hell are written the words, too late. A great chasm, verse 26, has been set in place. There comes a point when it's too late to seek God's forgiveness. You cannot go from there to you, nor can anyone cross over from there to us, says the passage. There's no purgatory. Uh, there's no time to repent once we're dead. It's given for all men to die once and then face judgment, says Hebrews 9, verse 27. Now, as I close, can I ask, who are we in this parable? Which leads to my third heading. We've had two men, two destinies, and now five living brothers. Can you see as we close, verse 28? I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they won't also come to this place of torment. So interestingly here, is someone in hell who desperately wants his loved ones warned. Doubtless, he loves his brothers. I'm sure they spent their Christmases together and they went on golfing holidays. They've all enjoyed the gifts of God and never thanked him and never bothered with the poor. And they sneer at the thought that real men need to bother with God. They're alpha males. And as you know, for them, religion's a handrail for the wife and children. Sorry to be sexist, but that's where they are, these fools. Uh, they're, and they think like their brother. And this brother in hell is desperate they're reached. It's interesting, isn't it? That here's someone in hell who is longing for the proclamation of the gospel, is longing that his loved ones are told. So they believe in evangelism, not just in heaven, but in hell. And of course, we're like these five brothers. It's as though well, there's a mirror up and we have a walk on part here. And what will we do? What will we do with the death of Jesus? What will we do with the warnings of Scripture? What will we do with the poor at our gate? Will we be like Lazarus, who trusts in the Lord? And can I ask you, God knows Lazarus' name. Does he know your name? And he'll know your name as you respond to the death of his son. And can I say, nothing can be more important than this. Nothing can be more important because... Jesus speaks here of a place called hell and he blocks the way to hell. He says the only way you can get there is by trampling over the cross. Please don't go there, I've died to save you. Well, in a moment, I'm gonna pray a prayer that will enable you to take advantage of what Christ has done. But before I do that, if you're a Christian, as we think about whether we're gonna communicate our faith to others, can I ask you some questions as we close? The first is, do you believe this? Do you believe in this red hot warning? Do you believe that Jesus died on the cross to save people from hell through the cross for heaven? 
Secondly, if you do believe it, well then, will you warn people? Do you think Jesus is lying as he speaks of hell? Or is he telling the truth? And thirdly, if we believe it and will warn people, well, the next thing is having enough love to speak. Or, or, or do you to sort of go, well, my faith is a personal, private thing. It helps me in my life. I wouldn't dream of imposing it on anyone else. Or will actually you find your identity in what Christ has done, find your security there and speak? Well, that's for the Christian. But if you're not a Christian, as we close now, here's a prayer for you that enables you to trust in what Christ has done. Let me read it once, and then I'll pray it through a second time, and you could repeat it phrase by phrase, and you'll have heard the warning of Scripture and trusted in what Christ has done to rescue you from hell. So here it is. Lord God, I'm so sorry that in many ways I've been like this rich man, taking your gifts and ignoring you, the giver. Most of all, I'm sorry for ignoring your son's death for me. Please forgive me and please send your Holy Spirit into my life and help me to live with Jesus as my master. Let me pray that slowly now, phrase by phrase. And if it's right for you, why not echo it now and come to faith? So here it is. So echo it as I speak it. Lord God, I'm so sorry that in many ways, I've lived like this rich man, taking your gifts and ignoring you, the giver. Most of all, I'm sorry for ignoring your son's death for me. Please forgive me and please send your Holy Spirit into my life and help me to live with Jesus as my master. Amen. Now, if you want to uh, respond further to that and investigate more of the Christian faith, why not come online to Hope Explored? Join us to find out more. And we're starting on Monday, the 28th of March. So eight days time, join us online for Hope Explored. Thank you for listening.
Luke chapter 16 and verse 31. If they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. Oh, Father God, wherever we are spiritually, we pray that you would enable us to be those who listen to the warning of Moses and the prophets. And Lord, we ask that as we read these warnings, you'd enable us to see what Jesus has done as he dies on the cross for our sin. Amen.